Hello and welcome to this lesson on Newton's Laws of Motion, which is part of the mechanics topic in AQAA level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at Newton's Laws of Motion, so we should be able to understand and derive Newton's Laws of Motion. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to define Newton's Laws of Motion, use F equals MA to calculate values where the mass is constant, and finally draw a free body diagram. So we're going to be looking at the following parts of the AQAA level physics specification 3.4.1.5 Newton's laws of motion. So Isaac Newton looked at how we can explain how an object moves in terms of the forces which change its motion, which is known quite commonly as dynamics. So this resulted in Newton's laws of motion, which describe the relationship between the forces acting on an object and its motion. Now the importance of Newton's laws of motion lies in their ability to explain a wide, wide range of phenomena, from the motion of planets to the behaviour of subatomic particles. So by understanding Understanding these laws, we can predict and explain the behaviour of objects in motion, so an allowance to design and engineer systems that work effectively and safely. Now together, Newton's laws of motion provide a framework for the understanding of the fundamental principles of motion and force, which underlie many areas of science and engineering. They also form the basis for classical mechanics, the study of motion of objects under the influence of forces, and they are a cornerstone of the modern physics which we build our understanding. On. Now their significance can be seen in many everyday applications, from the design of bridges and buildings to the development of space exploration technologies. So in the 17th century, astronomers began to use telescopes to observe the night sky, and they saw objects such as the planets which could move freely through space. They simply kept on moving without any, anything providing a force to push them. So with this, Galileo came to the conclusion that this was the natural motion of objects. So it was said that an object at rest will stay at rest unless a force causes it to start moving, and a moving object will continue to move at a steady speed in a straight line unless a force acts on it. So it was said that objects move with a constant velocity unless a resultant force acts on them. So being stationary is simply a particular case of this where our constant velocity is zero. Now the tendency of a moving object to carry on moving is known as inertia. So an object with a large mass is difficult to stop moving. Think about catching a cricket ball compared to a tennis ball. And similarly, a stationary object with a large mass is difficult to start moving, so think about pushing a car to get it started. And it is difficult to make a massive object change direction, so think about the way a fully laden supermarket trolley tries to keep moving in a straight line. Now all of these examples suggest another way to think of an object's mass. It's a measure of its inertia how difficult it is to change the object's motion. So we can say that uniform motion is the natural state of motion of an object. Now here, in this concept, we mean that uniform motion means moving with a constant velocity or moving at a steady speed in a straight line. Now this idea of inertia is an everyday experience that we encounter in our lives. So a passenger in a car feels like they're being pushed backwards when a car accelerates forward because the passenger's body has inertia and resist the change in the motion of the car. When you try to push a heavy box, it can be difficult to get it moving because it has a larger amount of inertia. When a football is kicked, it moves forward in a straight line until it's acted upon by an external force such as friction from a ground. When a roller coaster goes over a hill, the riders tend to lift out of their seats because their bodies want to keep moving in a straight line due to inertia whilst the roller coaster changes direction. And when you turn a corner in a car, you may feel like you're being pushed to the side. That's because your body wants to keep moving in a straight line as it has inertia whilst the car changes direction. So this leads to Newton's first law of motion. An object will remain at rest or in a state of uniform motion unless it's acted upon by a resultant force. So this means that a body will stand still or move in a straight line at a constant speed unless there's a resultant force acting on it. So if the forces act on a body are not balanced, the overall resultant force will make the body accelerate. Now this could be a change in the object's speed, the object's direction or both.
Now, Newton's second law of motion says that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the resultant force acting on it. This can be written as the following equation. F equals ma, where F is the resultant force in newtons, m is the inertial mass in kilograms, and a is the acceleration in meters per second squared. So this indicates that the greater the resultant force acting on a certain mass, the more acceleration you will get. This indicates that for a given resultant force, the more inertial mass you have, the less acceleration you get. Now this indicates that the mass is an inertial mass as it provides the tendency for inertia. So the mass of an object is a measure of its inertia or its ability to resist any change to its motion. So the greater the mass, the smaller the acceleration which results. So if you push your hardest against a small car which has a small mass, you'll have a greater effect than if you push against a more massive of car. Now just to clarify, the resultant force acting on the object is the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object. Now the acceleration is always produced in the same direction as the resultant force, so this law of motion only applies to objects with a constant mass, but this equation can be applied to nearly any situation in physics as there's lots of situations where a resultant force is acting on an object. Now for a given object, we just said before, the acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force. So if the net force act on the object is non-zero but in the opposite direction to the motion, this will cause the object to accelerate. In addition, for a constant force, and the acceleration is inversely proportional to its mass. Now, as we said before, if the net force act on an object is zero, according to Newton's second law of motion, the acceleration will also be zero. So in this case, the object will either be at rest or continue to move at a constant velocity following the New Newton's first law of motion. Now finally, when two objects interact with each other, each exerts a force on the other. Now Newton's third law of motion says that these forces are equal and opposite to each other. So this leads to the following law of motion. When two bodies interact, the forces they exert on each other are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So these two forces are sometimes described as the action-reaction force, but this is misleading because it sounds as though one force arises as a consequence of the other. In fact, that's not the case. The two forces appear at the same time and we can't say which force caused the other one. Now you'll also hear this law stated quite commonly as each action has an equal but opposite reaction. Now this actually implies that the forces are both applied to the same object. Now this is not the case, because if it was the case, then you would get a resultant force of zero and inertia would occur for all objects. Now the two forces that make up New a Newton's third law pair have the following characteristic. They act on two different objects. They are equal in magnitude, they are opposite in direction, and they are forces of the same type. So for example, two objects may attract each other because of the gravity of their masses, which would be the gravitational forces. Two objects may attract or repel each other because of their electrical charges, so they'll have the electrical forces. Two objects may be touching each other, providing contact forces. Two objects may be attached by a string and pull on each other, the tension forces, and two objects may attract or repel because of their magnetic fields, so you have the magnetic forces. Now the two forces in the Newton's third law of motion represent the same same interaction seen from two different perspectives. So for example, if you push against a wall, the wall will push back against you just as hard. When you stop pushing, so does the wall. If you pull a cart, whatever force you exert on the rope, the rope exerts the opposite pull on you. When you go swimming, you push back against the water with your arms and legs, and the water pushes you forward with an equal sized force. Now Newton's third law applies in all situations and to all types of forces. However, please remember, the forces are always the same type of force, have the same magnitude, and act on different objects. So sometimes it looks like there's a Newton's third law pair being applied, but actually it's not the case. So you must be careful when trying to work out if forces are Newton's law pairs. So for example, consider a person standing on the surface of the Earth. Now the two gravitational forces are a Newton's third law pair, as these two are opposite, okay, they act on two different objects and they have the same size. Now don't be misled into thinking that the person's weight and the contact force of the floor are a Newton's third law pair. Although they are equal and opposite, they do not act on different objects and they're not of the same type, so they can't be a Newton's third law pair.
Now, there are many applications of Newton's laws of motion in the real world. So, for example, in engineering, structural design uses Newton's laws as we use them to design buildings, bridges and other structures. So, we always analyse the forces act on different components to ensure structural integrity. Now, in transportation, understanding Newton's laws helps engineers design vehicles like cars, aeroplanes and spacecraft by considering factors like acceleration, braking and stability. And mechanical systems are important as machines and engines rely on the principles of Newton's laws to function effectively and efficiently. Now, in physics, astronomy uses Newton's laws to explain the motion of celestial bodies, including planets, moons and comets, and they form the basis of gravitational theory and help us understand a predict astronomical phenomena. Whilst in particle physics, Newton's laws are fundamental in understanding the behaviour of subatomic particles in particle accelerators, allowing scientists to study the fundamental forces and the particles of nature. Whilst in space exploration, we use Newton's third law in rocket propulsion because the ejection of high-speed gases generates a reactive force that propels the rocket forward. Whilst in orbital mechanics, Newton's laws play a crucial role in calculating trajectories, orbital manoeuvres and planning missions in space space exploration. Now Newton's laws of motion can be summarised as the following. Newton's first law, the velocity of an object is unchanged unless a resultant force acts on it. Newton's second law, the acceleration of an object is proportional to the resultant force acting on it, F equals ma. And Newton's third law, when two objects interact, the forces they exert on each other are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now we can apply Newton's laws of motion to any situation in the universe, for example riding the bus. So with Newton's first law, you get on the bus and stand up. When the bus is stationary, you feel no force when the bus accelerates you feel a backwards force now you want to stay where you are but the bus forces you to move so when the bus is at a constant speed you feel no forward or backwards forces the bus slows down you feel a forward force you want to keep on moving at the same speed but the bus is slowing you down so you fall forwards if the bus turns to the left you want to keep moving in a straight line so you're forced to the right in comparison to the bus and if the bus turns to the right you want to keep moving in a straight line so a force to the left now with the second law, as more people get on the bus, its mass increases. So if the driving force of the bus's engine is constant, we see it takes longer for the bus to gain speed. And finally, Newton's third law, as you stand on the bus, you're pushing down on the floor with the force that is equal to your weight. If this was the only force acting on you, you begin to move through the floor, but there's an equal but opposite force from the earth on you. So as a result, you will not fall through the floor, and you've got a force acting on the bus and a force acting on you. Now, we can also apply Newton's law of motion to examples such as a lift. So with the first law, when you get into the lift and it moves at a constant speed, you feel no force up or down. But when it sets, uh, sets off going up, you feel like you're pushed down because you want to stay where you are. When it sets off going down, you feel you are lighter, you feel pulled up. Now with Newton's second law, as more people get in the lift, its mass increases. If the lifting force is constant, we can see that it takes longer for the lift to get moving. Or we can see that the more people, the greater the lifting force must be. And finally, with Newton's third law, as you stand in the lift, there's a weight downwards to the earth, but an equal but opposite force from you to the earth. In addition, there's a normal force upwards from the floor to your feet, and there's a normal force downwards from the feet to the floor. So let's now have a look at a few examples of Newton's laws. So a car and caravan are accelerating in 0.5 meters per second squared. Find the driving force produced by the engine. So in this example, you, the engine must accelerate both the car and the caravan. So F equals MA. So M is 3,000 kilograms plus 5,000 kilograms times by 0.5 meters per second squared equals 4,000 newtons. Now again, with the same car and caravan, find the tension in the tow bar. Now, if you look at the example here, the tow bar is only going to be accelerating the caravan. So therefore, F equals MA. So it's the mass of the caravan, 5,000 times by the acceleration experiences 0.5 to equal 2,500 newtons. So as a result, find the resultant force on the car. Well, you know the overall resultant force, you know the force or the tension force provided on the caravan, so therefore you can find the driving force on the car. So resultant force is driving force minus tension, so it's 4,000 minus 2,500 equals 1,500. Alternatively, you could do F equals MA and say the mass of the car is 3,000 times by A 0.5, which are once again is 1,500 newtons. 
Another question may say, an object of mass 5.0 kilograms is accelerated from rest by a steady force of 10 newtons. Calculate its speed when it's travelled a distance of 8 metres. So in the answer, the first step is to use the equation f equals ma to find the acceleration. Now we know f is 10, and m is 5. So f equals ma, so a is 10 over 5, so a is 2 meters per second squared. We can then use one of our SUVAT equations, because we have constant acceleration, to find the final velocity v. So we know what a is, we know that u, the starting velocity, is 0, and we know s, the displacement, is 8. So we can use our equation v squared equals u squared plus 2as, so v squared equals 0 squared plus 2 times 2 times by 8. So v squared is 32, so therefore v is 5.7 meters per second. So to summarize what we've looked at in today's lesson, we should have a knowledge and application of the three laws of motion in appropriate situations, and F equals MA for situations where the mass is constant. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to define Newton's laws of motion, use F equals MA to calculate values where mass is constant, and we can draw free body diagrams. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson on Newton's laws of motion, which is part of the mechanics topic in AQAA level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.